you know, Stuff. lots, lots and lots and lots of education, specifically in becoming a librarian. You, you have to have a master's degree in the Dewey Decibel System. Basically, yeah. No, is, is that what it is? I, I think so. <laughs> I don't actually know. Do they even use that system in other countries, or is that just here in the U.S. or? Okay, you're getting way beyond my pay grade. I don't know any of this stuff. I just know that librarian is not, it's not. You hit a librarian button. Now I'm like so (laughs) fascinated. You, I'll just say this. You don't go straight from flipping burgers to becoming a librarian. That's a pull quote. Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. So Antonia, you and I have a friend. His name is Dan. He has INFP preferences. We've had him on the show multiple times talking about all of his adventures all over the world. And he often goes on long hikes. And I, I joke when he comes on to share all his adventures because from time to time he comes on the show and, and shares. I joke with people. And I say he's living the INFP dream, right? The career dream of an INFP who doesn't have to go to the office, doesn't have to clock in on a 40-hour work week. Although he's done that in yeah. his life. He has have to, had to do that. But at this point, in his 50s, early 50s, he's developed and built a life for him that's custom tailored for the career he wants to pursue, which really isn't a career on paper at all. It's being an adventurer, going on hikes and tailoring his life to him and how he's wired. So today we're going to talk about INFP careers. And if you just heard that story and you're an INFP, you probably resonate with the idea of choosing a career that feeds your soul, that makes your heart sing, that lights you up, that makes you feel like you're not just going and plugging yourself into the matrix and working that 40-hour work week, although some INFPs can do that and they like it. We'll talk about that today. But you probably want a career that fulfills you and makes you feel alive. And I don't believe that matters what career you pick, as long as it's in alignment with you as an INFP. I believe that's the key. So today as we talk, be thinking about what is an alignment for me? As we talk about the different career paths that INFPs can take, what resonates with you listening right now? We want to know that and we'll have an opportunity for you to come back and comment to us after this show is over. Well, I think there's a premise here that we're going to address as well, that it's not just choosing a career that resonates with who you are right now, but the career career you choose is also going to shape you. It's going to change you. And so it's not just what you're, it's not just what you want, it's also who you want to become. And the career you choose because you're spending 40 plus hours, you know, a week there, that's going to be a big influence on the kinds of skills you develop, the problems you're solving every day, the things you're focusing your attention upon. All of that matters. Um, I'm, I'm started, I think it was just this last, because we're doing a series, I think it was the last episode we did with ENTPs where we introduced this word career ship. And um, mm. a, a few weeks ago, we did a, a podcast on leadership. Yeah. And so I looked up the etymology of the word leadership and discovered that the word ship, the pie root of that, um, that ending, is related to the word shape. Yeah. And anything that with the word ship in it is going to be something that also shapes us, like a relationship. It's a it's a way of relating to another person that changes who we are because we're relating to them. That's what a relationship is. And in some ways, there's career ship, mm. meaning that the career we choose is also going to shape who we are. And so it's not just what I want. It's also who I want to become. So this idea of careers came about, this whole series of podcasts came about because we're in the middle of running our personality life path program. It's a mentorship. It's an eight-week mentorship. We have students and clients come and work with us. And every single week during this mentorship, as a group, we look at one of the archetypical energies of the Jungian cognitive functions. Now, that's a huge mouthful. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry. You don't need to know. Point is, we look at the different areas of life that these functions represent, both in the world energetically, but also how they relate to us and our personality types, all different personality types in the mentorship. We've been noticing that people in this program are going through a transition moment in their life. That's usually why they join this program. If you almost look at your personality type, like INFP, that's the you are here dot on the map of your life. That's how your mind is wired. That's how you learn information, how you make decisions. But it doesn't necessarily give you a path to pursue. It just tells you who you are. So we're working with these people over eight weeks to discover the path that each person, now that they know how they're attuned as a personality type, which path is the right path for them. 
Obviously, people are bringing transition moments up around relationships or lifestyle. But a big one, Antonia, is career. Many people, in fact, I would say most people in transition in that program, even the INFPs, are in the midst of transition of career. And they're asking questions like, well, what if I've been doing something for 20 years? Can I change a career trajectory? Is that available to me? What if I'm just starting out on my career? I mean, people are at different stages throughout this. And so this came up and we thought, we need to address this and talk about careers for all the types. And today we're talking about INFP, but we don't want to just talk about and say, okay, these are the careers for you, INFP. We want to give you some principles to go from so that you as an INFP can look and say, okay, all this is available to me. Which one resonates with me the most? Hmm. Yeah. And it's not in necessarily a, an obvious list. Uh, I, I do want to, I just want to quibble on one thing you said. Uh-oh. No, it's it's not a big one. It's an easy one. And I think you, your main point was that we look at type, like when we look at type, it diagnoses a lot of things that we can understand about ourselves, but it doesn't necessarily give us a specific direction unless we know yeah. right how to use it in that way. And you said it, it, it tells you who you are. And I just want to make a tiny little quibble because we are talking to INFPs. Uh, uh. <laughs> I just want to say it, um, it it tells you how you're pre-wired Certainly. to look at things. It doesn't tell you the essence of who you are, it INFP cannot. listening to me right now. That's yes. right. <laughs> right. And Ass- so, assuming we're not saying that, yes. We are not saying that. We are Clearly. not saying it tells you who you are. But it does tell you an awful lot yeah. about how your mind is wired to experience the world. And in some ways, it can also communicate a little bit of stewardship, yeah. like the kinds of things that you are pre-wired to pay attention to and to make sure are represented. And um, and in part, that is you know evidenced in your cognitive functions. Now, uh, we want to make sure because people at all levels of understanding are going, to, you know, could be watching this episode or listening to this episode. So we want to make sure that it's accessible to somebody who just discovered they have INFP preferences. We're going to make this simple enough to access, but we're also going to speak in a a, a little more of a technical way for anybody who is a type geek out there and wants all the information, all the technical stuff. So um, for the type geeks, uh, the two functions that you're pre-wired to use are introverted feeling or authenticity as your dominant or what we call your driver function. And it's supported by your auxiliary or what we call the co-pilot of extroverted intuition or exploration. And the reason why I mentioned that is because I, I, I talked about t- stewardship hmm. and understanding that you're pre-wired to focus on authenticity and also exploring ideas. Yeah. In some ways, it's your job to make sure that those two things are not forgotten, like the importance of those things. So when you're choosing a career, you want to make sure that that aspect of yourself is not lost in your choice. Absolutely. And so those are some of the principles we'll be talking about in a moment. Before we do that, though, I've got a handy list. I did my research, Antonia. Mm-hmm. I brought a handy list of all the, the top 10 INFP career choices according to the internet. All right. So this is, a, this is internet-based research. Drum roll. The top, the top 10 of what the internet says <laughs> are the proper, or the, you know, this is not well-researched. The internet says this. Okay, number one. So for INFPs, career choices according to the internet, number one is writer, number two, graphic designer, Three, counselor or therapist. Four, social worker. Five, psychologist. Six, artist. Seven, musician. Eight, teacher. Nine, librarian. I didn't know that was a career, but I guess it is. I thought it was maybe a job. At least for the time. Yeah. (laughs) And then 10 is nonprofit worker advocacy, which that also makes makes sense. Yeah. So do you think that's a pretty good list? I think that's an excellent list. Uh, And actually... Uh, somebody out there is a librarian they're going to be like what do you mean you didn't know it was a career you thought it was a job you actually i think you have to get like a master's what kind of librarian are you talking about no i'm not kidding it's like to become a librarian is like a big deal are you serious like i remember i'm thinking of a librarian as like a kid going to my local library in the town i lived in yeah and the woman who lived behind the counter was older than anyone else i knew in my entire life so much so that you just use the word lived as if she never left and she was just there all the time yes i mean that's the image i have of her are you kidding i didn't know this is a whole new p- live on air i'm finding out a whole new piece of information i did not know I and think. so i'm like a little blown away by this i think i could be wrong i mean obviously i'm this- not saying you're wrong i'm just no i mean i'm not saying that it's a hill i'll die on but i'm pretty sh- i'm pretty sure if i remember correctly librarian is a you have to have like 
you know, Stuff. lots, lots and lots and lots of education, specifically in becoming a librarian. You, you have to have a master's degree in the Dewey Decibel System. Basically, yeah. No, is, is that what it is? I, I think so. <laughs> I don't actually know. Do they even use that system in other countries, or is that just here in the U.S.? Or Okay, you're getting way beyond my pay grade. I don't know any of this stuff. I just know that librarian is not, it's you just, not. You hit a librarian button. Now I'm like so fascinated. <laughs> you, I'll just say this. You don't go straight from flipping burgers to becoming a librarian. That's a pull quote. Yeah. <laughs> That's a pull quote. We need like a graphic where it says Antonio Dodge episode whatever yeah. says, you don't just go from flipping burgers to be a librarian, okay? That's right. It's a whole thing. That's like a whole complicated <laughs> life path, I think. Yeah. Anyway, well, I mean, for the time being, as long as we have libraries. Yeah, I'm sure so. AI is going to handle librarian jobs at some point. Uh-oh. They're handling every job. I'm sure a librarian looking up stuff in a Dewey. Some librarian now is going to come and school me. I'm going to get it really bad. Real bad. Because they're going to be like, look, dude, you have no idea. And they're going to lay out know. point by point of just yeah. how ignorant I'm about about big librarian. Yeah. And like the whole career path and the whole industry of librarians. I'm in big trouble now. Big librarian is that like big pharma? Yeah, so we got to move on before I get in my <laughs> big library. It's it's a coalition of all these librarians who are actually secretly controlling the world. They, they have like lobbyists <laughs> in Washington. It's like in they the might. EU. I mean, it's it's big. they're part of NATO now. I mean, yeah. it's librarians are a big deal. It's a thing. Anyway, back to INFPs and careers. Yeah, uh, we're going to talk about this today. So just to reconfigure ourselves, we're going to talk about four subtypes of the INFP personality type. Now, these aren't actual types of INFPs. These are flavorings or almost, uh, not performances, but uh, what, what would you call it? Preferences or the way you show up to the world. What is the word I'm looking for? Uh, I don't know. Um, the person whose work we're basing this upon, Dr. Yeah. Dario Nardi, he liked the word variant until recently <laughs> when the word variant has been a little co-opted. But Keeps they're like, they're flavors. Yeah, uh, flavors. Yeah, he resisted the word subtype because he didn't want people to think that like your type, yeah. which there's a lot of information that indicates that we come pre-wired with our type. Like that's a um, that's a nature thing. Yeah. Uh, this is more of a nurture component. This is more about how your environment has helped shape the way your you know how your INFP preferences show up. Yeah. And so you can actually change it since it's nurture. It's one of those things where you're not stuck in any specific subtype. But we do definitely find ourselves landing there because of the experiences we've had growing up and because of the careers we choose. Yeah. So this came from Dr. Dario Nardi bringing INFPs, like you listening, into his laboratory, connecting them to EEG brain scan machines, asking a series of questions, already knowing their type, and then watching four different patterns of brain scans show up on the brain scan software. So now he started to see this pattern come up where certain career choices... We're matching the EEG mis machine scans for INFPs, all, all the types, but we're talking to you as an INFP right now. So he borrowed some language from Victor Glanko, Dr. Victor Glanko, who is, works with Socionics in Europe. He borrowed four words that he's associated with these subtypes. So of the INFP, there's a dominant subtype, creative, normalizing, and harmonizing. And then... He also worked in some of Dr. Helen Fisher's work around neurotransmitters, dopamine, uh, ser uh, not serotonin, dopamine, testosterone, estrogen. And they also map to these four subtypes mm -hmm. of INFP. So we believe as we talk about this today and we identify which subtype you as an INFP are listening along, this is going to help you in your career choice, picking the correct career path for your specific expression of INFP. Maybe you're not like our friend Dan who wants to just adventure all the time. Maybe you do enjoy going to an office and having that stability in your life. And we're going to talk about why today. Hmm. Let's yeah. dive into it. Do you have any more to say before we jump right into the first one of dominant? No, let's do it. All right. So dominant INFPs. Yeah. What does this flavoring of INFP look like? So this is a, this is a flavoring of INFP that I think people, well, it's not the, it's not the prototype in a lot of people's minds. Um, in fact, this INFP might think of themselves as having judger prefer you know, preferences or possibly even being an ENFP, but it's a, it's a legit INFP subtype. Uh, these INFPs are more driven and confident hmm. and they have a very strong character. That's what they show to the world is a strong character. Um, they are almost like on a quest or a crusade. And they hold themselves together with endurance toward that ideal. Hmm. So they're very driven to make sure that whatever it is that they believe 
you know, should be mirrored in the world, you know, their personal ideals, they're very driven to accomplish them. So it's an ambitious flavor of INFP. They are also relatively quick with their decision making or their processing of new information and then sharing their reaction to it. And so that's that might not be decision making per se, but it's a it's a faster action or reaction time than their other INFP subtype brethren. And uh, I think that's important to know that there are some INFP subtypes mm. that this dominant one in particular that actually has a little faster reaction time. Now, it's in comparison, though, to other INFPs. They're not going to probably have as quick a reaction time as, say, an ESTP type. Yeah. But in comparison with other INFPs, they are faster. And in part because they're relying a bit on templates. They use templates as ways of thinking and working that they can draw on quickly. And so uh, in some ways, they've kind of pre-thought things out. They've sort of figured out how they feel about that thing. And so when it gets introduced to them, they have a strong reaction and they know how they're going to feel about that. Uh, they still have, though, the typical INFP, you know, uh, skills or talents at listening. So they still are very good with communication. Um, they're very good at listening to other people. But un unlike other INFP types, this is in particular listening for somebody's agenda. What is this person really motivated by? What is it that they really want underneath? And that be that's very clear to this subtype. Um, they are also... Uh, highly imaginative just like other INFPs um, and uh, and so they have a strong access to their intuition their intuitive side with imagination yeah but because they favor a faster reaction time and so they used some of these templates to do it their intuition is almost like an on-off switch. It, they have access to strong imagination but it might take a little bit of time for it to wake up yeah and that means they can't you know, super rely on their intuition for whatever career they're choosing because their intuition, um, it kind of slows them down a little bit, yeah. right? a little more than they want to be slowed down when they're trying to get their crusade accomplished. Well, and I can imagine you mentioned that they're very much listening for people's motivations and maybe writ large, not just one person, but an aggregate. Because if you have to resource manage, which also includes managing people to get something accomplished and you're more dominant in your style you have to know what gets that group to do this thing or that person to do this thing. You may not be, you may not have the talent as an INFP to have all the checklists and all of that. Mm -hmm. You need to probably rely on your motivational strategies of inspiration, yes. of motivation, of, of getting people inspired to do the thing you need them to do. So you have to listen for and track that as a dominant INFP. I mean, all INFPs do this, but I think dominant, it's probably a, uh, a strategy mm -hmm. to be able to lead and guide and get the things done they want to get done. Right, exactly. And so because of that, um, their quiet time, of course, is precious, just like all introverts. They need that quiet time. But when they do that, they're, they're determining how they feel about where they're at, any new inputs, yeah. whatever's going on. Uh, but the rumination, I think, is a little shorter than maybe for other INFPs. They they probably give themselves a little less quiet time than other INFPs do because these are an INFP that's on a mission, yeah. right? And so uh, they they expect more out of themselves when they're bringing this to the world. So when they get that quiet time, they're doing a lot of sorting about you know what's happened, how it makes them feel, what's important to them, and anything that isn't might not get a lot of rumination time about why it might just get edited out yeah. and they're just staying on mission and on track and that's what makes it dominant right and uh and so the qualities and characteristics that you might see um in this type is that they might appear maybe even overly idealistic to other people hmm. they will appear to be um very ethical and moral it's very important for them to show up as examples of ethics and morality so um, they might appear a little overly idealistic. Uh, they might also appear a little preachy sometimes, maybe rigid, sometimes extreme. But they're actually really good at making the thing that's important to them happen. And so they're also inspirational leaders. They're, like, they're fantastic. People will follow them because they can see their vision and they want to follow them. So there's, a, there's a, a little bit of rigidity that's required in order to make all of that happen. And so um, anything public-facing... Anything that is um, administrative, they actually tend to do very well in. 
Uh, it depends, of course, on their interests, but the kinds of things that they tend to pursue is, interestingly enough, business, education, law, music, psychology, social work. Those are all very popular choices. Um, they oftentimes have a talent for music if they choose to develop it, the subtype does. But I think with specificity, some of the careers that they might choose or what I've seen dominant INFPs choose are things like nonprofit executive director. Mm. I've seen examples of that. Um, you mentioned INFP with writing, journalists in particular for dominant INFPs, yeah. uh, journalism, um, copywriting, right? Anything that kind of requires that like more assertive voice. And of course, psychology is always an interest. Yeah. So what about mistypes? Mm. I know this type, because they're so dominant, they might show up as somebody different. Yeah, I think, uh, I think as I mentioned before, they might think of themselves as having judger tendencies yeah. or preferences. They might think they're a judger type. They might also believe they're an extrovert. I wouldn't be surprised if they think that they might even be a TJ type, yeah. right? This might be an INFP that believes that they have INTJ preferences perhaps, or maybe even ENTJ preferences uh, because of that capacity to get, you know, to really focus and hone in on and, and, and lead and get things done in their minds. Yeah. So that's all the topical stuff. If you are a type geek, type nerd, <laughs> and you're, you're following along and you're looking for more of the deeper stuff connected to cognitive functions, uh, they use the cognitive functions. You already talked about them, Antonia. Introverted feeling, authenticity is the driver or dominant cognitive function for INFPs. The co-pilot or auxiliary is extroverted intuition. We've nicknamed it exploration. So they are judging, they're, they're going through their world, making decisions using authenticity, introverted feeling, and they're perceiving the world and understanding it using advanced pattern recognition, extroverted intuition or exploration. So there's an attunement of these functions and that's why they're a dominant subtype. Mm -hmm. How these functions show up for an INFP, and that's all of these have a pattern to them. Right. The way these functions are attuned, that's what makes this the case. So let's talk about that. Uh, so each function all eight cognitive functions can have what's called an analytic preference or a holistic preference. An analytic is more of a targeted, focused, driven energy. Um, it's a little bit more like having blinders on, but moving forward towards a single target. Whereas the holistic preference of a function is a little bit more open. It's, it sees more of the peripheral. It wants to take in a broader expanse. But because of that, it has a more diffused energy. And it tends to be a little better at being receptive. Hmm. Um, seeing a bigger picture, being receptive, not as, not as uh, driven, but a, taking in a little bit more territory. For dominant INFPs, both the perceiving and the judging functions that you mentioned, they're both analytic. They both have that targeted, almost blinders on sort of uh, orientation yeah. that makes them so assertive in the world. Yeah. And if you're following along with neurotransmitters, this subtype is attracted to testosterone. Yeah. That's the neurotransmitter that it's most associated with is yeah. testosterone. And each one has those uh, associations. Yeah. And, uh, and if you want more information about this, by the way, we recorded an entire podcast with Dr. D Dr. Dario Nardi about subtypes. So you yeah. can go look that up and we'll make sure to have links under the episode. Yeah. Okay. So that's the dominant subtype. we got three more left. Let's talk about the creative INFP. Now, I'm sure all INFPs are like, well, I'm creative. What do you mean creative subtype? <laughs> yeah. This is, I think this is a little bit more in people's minds when they think about INFPs as a prototype, is the creative subtype. Is this, the, uh, is this that image of the INFP holding the balloon that just walks off the cliff, not realizing, <laughs> like they're kind of like just daydreaming and wandering <laughs> and a yeah. little unaware of yeah. their circumstances or surroundings? Yeah, I think it was, they were holding, was it a balloon or a flower and they're about to walk off a cliff Something into like, um, like a, a, a whole uh, sort of pit of rabid dogs yeah. <laughs> and is like another romantic enters the world. Yeah. <laughs> it's very INFP. But I think it is more the sort of um, the the creative, rom curious dreamer style of the INFP. So um, these INFPs are playful, right? Usually delightfully playful. Uh, they bring curiosity, fun, a bubbly imagination. Uh, they trust the gift of magic. They seem a little bit more extroverted maybe than some of the other subtypes. Um, and they have more of a get things going feel about them. Uh, they are very good at brainstorming. They have a very strong what's called a starburst pattern in EEG machines. And so that means that their brains light up when they do things like, um, you know, brainstorm with another person. And they, they make all those connections in their minds very quickly. They have excellent capacities to think outside the box more than maybe the dominant INFP would. And they also have a harder time focusing 
right? Mm-hmm. Unsurprisingly, uh, they might have jumped around from career to career. They have a really hard time focusing on one thing and just doing one thing for a long time. But because of that, then they're suited to certain kind of work more than others. You know, they might be really suited to travel, right? Mm. The arts, uh, working with small groups all over the place. And uh, because they are a creative subtype and because they have all of this imagination and outside the box thinking, they're the ones who tend to legitimately go into the arts, right? Filmmaking, um, things like uh, uh, the visual arts. And um, also, you know, philosophy might be interesting or, you know, something in journalism might be interesting, something that allows them to stay open ended and not have to make those definitive choices like the dominant subtype does. Yeah. So so mistypes as well. My guess is that because they're so artistic, maybe they would mistype as I don't know, maybe the intuition isn't maybe the intuition is really high. Mm. Right. So they might mistype as a different I don't know. Is it, do you think mistypes the thing with this creative or is this pretty much no, we know they're an INFP? I think that if a mistype is going to happen, it's probably a confusion around whether or not they're an ENFP or an INFP. Yeah. They might have like a bit of more of an extroverted feel about them. And so they might mistype as extroverts. But I, again, like I think we kind of, we make a lot of space in the type world, right? In the type community for this style of INFP. Yeah. Um, they're also very good with humor, right? Okay. Um, they are good with uh, abstract language, and um, different concepts. They, t- they make decent speakers, right? So they could do something in public speaking. Uh, they tend to lack what's called a halo um, effect in EEG machines, which are the part of us that understands sort of practical application. Yeah. <laughs> like that when we build a lot of really practical skills, we tend to have a good halo, um, either social skills or administrative practical skills. Uh, and when we lack that halo, it means that we're, we, have a, we have a hard time having the rubber hit the road. And so they do tend to lack that halo effect, but more about administratively practical things than social things. And, um, you know, it's sometimes hard to do things that seem like basic requirements, right? Yeah. They might have a little bit of self-consciousness around not being able to, you know, I don't know, pay their taxes or whatever, or do things that other people seem to do so effortlessly. Mm. Uh, but that said, if they can allow themselves to flow through life, right? As opposed to having to do like everything that everybody else does. Um, they are really good at exploring the human condition, right? Mm. That, that's really what they excel at is watching themselves have a life, watching themselves explore what it means to be human. And they have a high value for freedom. They love, you know, stories. Yeah. And so there's a couple different types of career paths that can really suit them. Uh, We've already mentioned filmmaking, but I think I suspect there's um, quite a few human interest filmmakers specifically that are creative IF, INFP ty- uh, subtypes. Yeah. Um, again, we mentioned journalism and the visual arts, but you know, travel blogging and writing in that f- um, frame, they could be something that goes or a person that goes into creative writing. Uh, and counseling and therapy still is right up the a- alley for this kind of subtype because they are so into the human condition. So I'm just looking at some of those characteristics of the creative styled INFP versus the dominant styled. And I look at the dominant and I'm like, okay, this INFP probably needs some type of leadership role, something maybe they started, maybe some executive career path, some progression to take on more and more responsibility because they have that they have that desire to lead and help influence and direct people toward a goal. I don't think that's for the creative subtype as much. They might want to be a thought leader or an emotional leader, but I don't think managing people is necessarily going to be not only in their wheelhouse, but their desire. Like, yeah. It's unlikely that they're going to have a single-minded crusade yeah. for an extended period yeah. of time. It's more like they're probably going to have a lot of little crusades, yeah. like little things that they enjoy. And the dominant subtype has to make some bargains, right? Mm-hmm. They have to decide that they're not going to you know, have as wide a range of imaginative, yeah. free-flowing experiences in order to make something happen that's truly important to them. Whereas this INFP won't, doesn't really make that bargain. They want that freedom. They want yeah. to ha- have the capacity to explore all those things. That freedom can be tough, though. Mm-hmm. because And I've got two words here I wrote down. I wrote subsidized or platformed. Mm. So for the creative INFP, if you're listening right now, one of the things you could be thinking about is, okay, if I want to be creative... And I don't want to have to go build the structure and all the infrastructure and all the things to support that. I need to find someone that can be my patron. Like literally, I know that's an online platform, but like 
go ahead and subsidize me, help fund what I do creatively, whether they buy my art or help support me in some way. Or what's great about the modern world is we have all these platforms that allow creative subtypes to still put their stuff out there like Etsy mm-hmm. or Uber right. or YouTube or pick the platform of your choice, which creates a speed of trust between people so you can buy and sell products and services and, or put your content out there, mm-hmm. make ad revenue or whatever. Like You might be able to find a career path that's a little bit unique to you as an INFP now because of technology, because of all the infrastructure and the platforms that exist, I think that's available to you. So if you're dominant, if you're resonating with a dominant, you might want to pursue avenues of leadership, executive career stuff, but this creative platforms, I think are your friend. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, Dari mentions that they really benefit from having a person that's a stabilizing force in their life. Yeah. So there's partnership you know, opportunities as well. If somebody can help be that stabilizing force, then yeah. you know that could be the quote unquote platform. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Oh yeah. And then um, he also mentions that when push comes to shove, this INFP can get things done. Of the, course. They're not hopeless, obviously, right? They're going to be able to get things done. But he says, um, as long as goals, values, and the environment all gel. Hmm. So that's also important when you're choosing your career. Know that. It's going to have to be something that inspires you to want to buckle down. Yeah. Right. All those things are going to have to be in alignment in order to push through those moments where like, I really don't want to do this, but you can. It's just, you have to make sure that you've got those ducks in a row. So let's talk a little bit deeper for someone that's following along a little bit more advanced material, talking about the two cognitive functions, Mm. dominant driver, co-pilot or auxiliary, introverted feeling authenticity driver. And the co-pilot is exploration or extroverted intuition. Mm -hmm. What's the attunement of these? If the dominant, both of them are analytically focused. Mm -hmm. What about the creative subtype? So with a creative subtype, it's the perceiving function that's analytic in this case. Um, And so, or not in this case, in all cases for creative subtypes. But in this case, as you mentioned, it would be extroverted intuition or exploration. So that would be the analytic bent. That's the one that wants, it it doesn't want to have to not, go pursue whatever is it, it's interested in, right? It wants it wants to be able to pursue whatever is exciting and interesting in the moment. But it's the judging function, in this case, introverted feeling or authenticity, that has the holistic yeah. bent. So there's a lot less insistence on, you know, on that crusade. It's less single-minded. It's way more open-framed. It's a little bit more diffused. It's not as, um, it's not as in, uh, married to yeah. making sure that its ideals are represented in the world. And because of that, that's what makes it, that's what gives this subtype a more relaxed feel around that. One way I like to think about it sometimes is how compromising is this function in your life? If it's not very compromising and it's very focused, it's probably an analytic function. If it's, yeah, I'll work with you. I'll compromise. I'll, I'll bend a little bit and meet you where you're at. It's probably more holistic hmm. in its expression. Right. So what you're talking about is, is an INFP who doesn't compromise on their imagination, their intuition, what they're doing. They're like focused on it. Mm-hmm. It's theirs. Get on the bus or not. But I'm open to the judgments of things. Let's let's work together to find the best way through and how we decide what to do. Yeah, it's less asserting how I think the world should be constructed and trying to craft it out of that image. And it's a little bit more about the introspection of the human experience. Mm. It's a little less insistent on ideals and more open to, well, why are these ideals the way they are? And yeah. let's just kind of be open with that. And so it's, uh, yeah, it, it tends to, yeah, it tends to be a little bit more meet you in the middle. So we've talked about the dominant INFP. We've talked about the creative INFP. Let's talk about it's a hard word for me. It makes me feel a little icky inside. Normalizing <laughs> INFP. Not if you identify with this, you don't make me feel icky no, as an INFP. Definitely not. But the idea that anything could be normalized or normal, like just the, the word creeps me out. I don't know why. Yeah. But there are, even of my personality type, people that identify a lot with this subtype. And so what does the INFP normalizing subtype look like? Yeah. Well, uh, it's unsurprising that you don't like it because... I think you have creative subtype preferences. Oh, there you go. And the creative and the normalizing are exact opposites, right? They're they're uh, they don't often play well with each other, um, but they actually really benefit from being in each other's energy. Unsurprising. So this is a more conventional and specialized style of INFP, and this is um they they function a little bit better in mainstream society. Mm. Uh, they don't have that challenge that the creative INFP subtype does where 
it's like hard to you know buckle down and do all that stuff that society requires of us yeah um but uh this type works hard. They're extremely loyal to loved ones and friends. Um, they, they they do their best to be beacons of calm, hmm. right? They're like a more chill INFP. Uh, a more chill INFP that just does what needs to be done, right? As opposed to the INFP, the creative subtype that might even believe they have ENFP preferences. They might even mistake themselves for um, extroverts. This INFP might mistake themselves for having sensory preferences or perhaps also being a judger, but they'll know that they're an introvert. The normalizing style tends to rely more on patience and hard work than creative ideas to get through things. Hmm. Um, they also excel at speaking and listening. All INFPs really have this capacity for communication, particularly listening. Listening but, to other people's stories, mm -hmm. like deep listening to a story of another human being right uh, this infp actually uh even though all infps are good at what you just mentioned listening to a story there is also a lot of capacity for language-based reasoning hmm. and linear deduction and abstract concepts so it might almost be a little bit more of a thinker style of infp as well they might they might mistake themselves for having thinking preferences this might be an infp that thinks they are an intp as well because they have that capacity to listen and plug it into those abstractions a little bit more they're less thinking about it just on the terms of what it says about who they are as a person and more trying to figure it out and so um it's uh this infp might actually come across like I said, almost like having thinker preferences. So what, what I imagine is happening there is language is like compressed thought, right? A word means so much. And a lot of, I mean, clearly an INFP is going to resonate with the emotions that they feel, mm -hmm. like the deep emotions that come up that usually are non-lingual or post-lingual. Like you can't really describe the complexity of introverted feeling or authenticity emotions. But if you're focused on language models and the way we use language, you're going to be a little bit more of a digital thinker. It's not as analog in your heart and your guts. It's more up in your head and the logic and the like the literal lines of script with the language we're using. So I'd imagine this does lend itself to somebody who like you might find this type of INFP, I'm guessing as we go through the job list, like in the lab doing mm -hmm. like research yep. or being able to, you know, do, do, I mean, I'm probably a host of things around mm -hmm. language, you know, English majors, teaching, like all sorts of stuff like this, right? Yeah. Let's yeah. go down into some of the jobs they would have. Well, I was going to say that the, uh, they have, uh, 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 enough of a capacity for contemplation that it stands out. Yeah. So facts, figures, symbols, metaphors, memories, stories, they ruminate on all of those long and deep. And so that is a more, that's like a thoughtful version, not just like an introspective version, but like one that really contemplates on things like numbers. So um, like you said, that they might be more attracted to the sciences. They might be more attracted to, um, you know, uh, things that are more technical in nature. Mm. Again, this is the opposite of the creative INFP. The creative INFP is leaning real hard on their imagination, leaning really hard on being able to come up with new things. This INFP is a little bit more leaning on rumination and really being able to be thoughtful. So uh, you might find them in pretty much any traditional career, even really technical ones, um, particularly large institutions. They tend to find themselves in bigger companies, organizations, and institutions. And some of the kinds of roles they tend to take on is unsurprisingly teacher, but also researcher, right? Like you mentioned, mm -hmm. and this could be anything like a social researcher, market research, user experience research, right? Because they're still interested in the human experience, yeah. but the human experience as it pertains to how it related to whatever they just, you know, what, whatever, what this, um, this, uh, uh product is right. Uh, nonprofit worker is one that's very common for INFPs, no matter what, but things like quality assurance engineer, yeah. That could also be in the wheelhouse of this kind of INFP. Technical writing. Writing is always a strength for INFP types, but this could be more of a technical style as opposed to, say, journalism or creative writing. This could be about, like, you know, really putting onto the page how a person needs to understand something in order to be able to engage with it. Yeah. And uh, any form of documentation. But they could also be, like, a policy analyst or, um, you know, a, a lab researcher. There's a lot of things that can fit this INFP label. Okay. So if you're identifying with this INFP... This subtype of normalizing 
I think one thing to be mindful of is, well, two things. One is you're probably the subtype that's going to have the most challenge getting out of your rut and getting out there into the world to do something new, to open up some new energy. Like you're going to want to stay in your comfort zone. It's just you're, of the subtypes, you're going to want to do that. Mm. It's also important for this subtype though, that you might have a traditional job or that lab job. That maybe it's not a traditional job, but it's a job that you have to show up to or mm-hmm. something you got to like, people are relying on you. Things are relying on you. You're probably highly specialized. We found that all types that identify with this normalizing really do need an outlet outside of their workplace. Mm-hmm. And I don't think INFPs are any different. They need something to keep that energy of extroverted intuition, exploration, that co-pilot auxiliary function. Keep it humming, even if it's just a hobby, just mm-hmm. something outside of your normal day to day. Otherwise, you're going to start to see the light and you go out over yeah. time. Yeah. And so that's something I think this type has to be very, just like the, the creatives had to be mindful of the platform or something. Mm-hmm. This type has to be mindful that they don't get themselves too static, too stuck in a rut. Well, there's actually three different disadvantages to being the style of INFP. Wow. Uh, Not just two. There's three. (laughs) Well, uh, I mean, I guess you... Let me come in again. I guess, yeah. I guess you could say that one of them might not be a, you know, a disadvantage for the INFP themselves, but um, this could be the more stubborn of the, of the subtypes. They tend to be the most stubborn. What? Yeah. (laughs) And so, like you said, that's a little bit associated with the rut piece. Um, that, that's what comes along with being, you know, somebody who's thinking deeply is that you kind of get attached to the things that you've been thoughtful and contemplative of, but they're also simultaneously very tolerant. So it's a tolerant subtype that when you hit the thing you hit, they're pretty stubborn. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second is that they tend to downplay themselves, Mm. um, for the greater good or maybe even sacrifice themselves for the greater good. And so they might do a job uh, for a long time and be overlooked or not have people really understand their contribution. And so uh, one of the disadvantages is that they really need to kind of speak up for themselves. So this is that keeping that extrovert intuition, you're in a meeting and you have a great idea and people don't hear it, they overlook it or they dismiss it. That energy, bringing more of that energy forward of assertion, yeah. it's going to help you be heard. Yeah, exactly. So that's this subtype has to do that. Yeah, and so they might want to lean in a, a little bit on the dominant uh, INFP for that to make sure that they're not being overlooked and they're not being passed over, especially when they've worked hard to get it. Um, and finally, the third disadvantage is that they tend to be the clumsiest of all the INFPs. Uh, in brain scans, it appears as if they have some of the worst visual spatial capacity. So they might want to shy away from anything where they have to do dangerous physical activities. Like driving? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> right, something I mean, I was that's, kidding, but you're serious. <laughs> yeah, like if they are a long haul truck driver, that might be something that's not the best choice of job or anything oh, that requires okay. like a, a like physical danger um or puts puts themselves in a position where physically like visual spatial capacities are very important so that's the that's one of the disadvantages as well gotcha mm-hmm. all right so let's talk a little deeper deeper level here neurotransmitter serotonin mm-hmm. that's going to be uh the, the drug of choice yeah drug of choice um, and then what, how the attunements of the two cognitive functions, so introverted feeling, authenticity, driver, dominant, and co-pilot of extroverted intuition or exploration, mm-hmm. auxiliary, what's the attunement of these two functions? So it's the opposite of the creative. So in this case, it would be the judging function, introverted feeling, like you mentioned. The judging function is the analytic function, and the perceiving function of extroverted intuition is the holistic. Mm. So there's a lot more certainty around the, um, you know, sort of the that crusade concept is a little more familiar to them, like believing things are really important and having that drive. But the intuitive aspect, sort of the, the, the part that comes up with the imaginative ideas and gets really creative, that part's a little bit more open, right? Mm. It's not as, um, it's, it, it doesn't have as certain of a, um, uh, uh, they're, they're not leaning on as much certainty as the INFP is with their creativity. Well, that would also speak maybe to that characteristic of, I mean, stubbornness is the word you used, but resistance to quick changes like if my introverted feeling is an INFP, if your introverted feeling or authenticity is focused and doesn't want to make compromises, mm-hmm. well, it's not going to want to make compromises. You want to stay on course, right. what you want to do in the world. 
And so you're going to be less likely to go, oh, yeah, let's work together on this. No, you have a vision of what you think is the right way to go. Your should statements are very definitive. Mm-hmm. Whereas if it's not anything that triggers any of that, then you're pretty open. Yeah. You're open to whatever's going on. So yeah. it's also it's that's where you get that tolerance and at the same time, this, this stubbornness. So let's talk about the fourth subtype for INFPs. We've talked about the dominant. We've talked about the creative. We've talked about the normalizing. Now let's talk about the harmonizing INFP subtype. Hmm. Okay. So these INFPs, and, and, and this is the case for most um, harmonizing subtypes, is that it, it's more common later in life to be a harmonizing subtype. You can have younger uh, harmonizing subtypes, but it is usually something a person finds over time and through a bit of seasoning. So they're the most multifaceted, sophisticated, and tolerant of all the INFPs. Um, they're more of behind the scenes kind of style working so that they don't really like to put themselves in the limelight necessarily. They're not, they don't have that like in charge style. They don't have like a get things going style. They're a little bit more behind the scenes. They facilitate more than anything. And, um, they are, they have kind of a complicated way of seeing things built on, you know, sort of like the fruits of all their experiences in life as, and that's why it is most common when they're later in life. Um, they're natural humanists, natural therapists. They really understand the human condition. Uh, they are also, um, they easily notice clues to work off of. So when they're talking to another person, they're very, they're like studying them. They're very in tuned and attuned to the signals that other people are giving them, which is of course why they make very good therapists. And they are um, very driven to help them in terms of energy or emotions in any way that would really facilitate the other person's experience. So they're very tuned into individuals yeah. and very tuned into like, what is it that the person needs? Do they need me to hold their energy, their emotions? What's going on for this uh, individual? And, um, and that attunement to others is part of what makes them, um, you know, sort of have like this really sophisticated way of experiencing so the f- multifaceted elements of life because yeah. they're not just checking in with their own stuff. They're really in- attuned to other individuals. So we know that all INFPs are good listeners, especially to other people's stories. This is probably the top of the list. Out, out of yeah. all four subtypes, mm-hmm. the harmonizing INFP probably has an attunement to just sit there and really not just listen to somebody's story, mm-hmm. but almost get into the person's experience, their mm-hmm. perspective, where they're coming from. Like, if I was you, this is how I'd be feeling. Again, all INFPs can do this, Mm -hmm. but this is probably the one that lends itself more to that. Well, and they're really good at sort of tuning into the complex interplay of clues that a person is giving off. Yeah. And then also keeping a storehouse of memories of how that person has been. Yeah. And so they're studying a person over time. And so they get this really intricate uh, awareness of the layers of a person, how they're growing over time. A composite. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, the patterns, the behavioral patterns that they have access to are very high yeah. because they've watched this person and and not just like kind of studied their perspective, but like watched them change and grow over time yeah. and really being in tune with that individual. And so there's um, there's a certain level of insight into that person's psych- like journey, Right. Not, not just the psychology of what they're showing up with at this time with a little bit of backstory, but like they're really in tuned with somebody's somebody's spiritual and psychological journey. So this could be anything from maybe a criminal profiler as a job choice to a pastor, a counselor, a therapist, mm-hmm. maybe even like a yoga instructor. I'm mm-hmm. guessing like maybe more of like the anything that has to do with mind, body, arts or practices like massage therapist, this is probably that subtype here. Yeah, potentially. Um, uh, what's interesting is I didn't see as much yoga instructor, but I did see things like massage therapist. Yeah. Right. Somebody kind of more in tune to sort of the energy piece of it. So more more healing than teaching. Mm-hmm. More like com- showing up and being part of the, I don't know, doing humaning well, like mm-hmm. coming alongside. And I'll, I would also say maybe this uh, might find in like HR, human resources, things of anything has to do with mm-hmm. like any human dynamics that need people management. Yeah. Well, if you want me to read the list, I've Let's got, um, I mean, the obvious clear one would be clinical psychologist or therapist, but anthropologist was on the list. Mm-hmm. Um, screenwriter. Yeah. Right. Um, somebody who's like writing about the human condition. Novelist would also be up there. Uh, community organizer, interestingly enough. 
um, because of uh, the capacity to sort of um, understand what's motivating people. Uh, not so much the um, sort of the dominant subtype form of community organizer, but more like somebody who's sort of, you know, sort of encouraging people to go do the thing that they think they should be doing to give back to the community. Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, educator. There is a teaching component in here, but more like special needs educator, like somebody who's really in tune with what that person needs that other people might miss. Um, and, um, you know, like uh, art uh, teacher. They also mentioned um, like a Montessori style school teacher could also really fit into this kind of INFP. And then anything creative would also work. Music, you know, that kind of thing. Like art therapy would be up there too. Yeah. And uh, Dario mentions that they have a nose for understanding symbolic imagery in the unconscious, almost like reading a fine character novel. Hmm. So again, it's almost like they turn everything into a, like the human story, basically. Um, and uh, they also excel in areas like international relations and family counseling could be a big top choice. Um, and for themselves, they usually have a very rich inner world that includes their spiritual life that's almost beyond words to share. So they might have a really hard time communicating sort of the depth of their inner inner world. But he says that's what serious and humorous novels, plays, and films are for. Hmm. So again, they might find an outlet in writing about the human condition in some form of fiction in order to just express the tiniest little bit of what's going on internally for them. So this is a, this is usually an older INFP. Man, some of the characteristics you described sound like a, an INTJ or an INFJ. I suspect that a harmonizing INFP is probably going to mistype as an INJ of some type, you know, in some form. If they're going to mistype. If they're going to mistype. Yeah. And so that's just something to be mindful of. You probably know you're an INFP listening, but some INFPs in our world, our clients, our students have struggled. Am I an INFJ? Am I an INFP? I don't know. Like, and they've gone back and forth between those two. And maybe they were more this style of INFP, this more harmonizing style, which has more of those esoteric characteristics like mm -hmm. you'd find in like an INFJ, for example. Yeah. Well, and, uh, but I think what's really interesting is that, um, the capacity for, uh, the capacity for tracking a person's story, like watching them over time, which brings in for the tech, for those of you who are type geeks, a little bit of that introverted sensing or memory, Yeah. the capacity to chart it and watch the other individuals changes. I think INJ types more sort of tap into the pattern as it is right now, whatever they're experiencing in the moment, since it's associated with extroverted sensing and figuring out that pattern. But I think that the strength of this kind of INFP really comes in being familiar with a person, really being able to watch their story. That's when those deep insights really strike them. So from a neurotransmitter standpoint, estrogen mm -hmm. is the choice here, or that's the proclivity or the mm -hmm. desire. Um, and then what about the function attunement? So we've got the two front functions. One is introverted feeling authenticity as the driver or dominant. The copilot is auxiliary. The copilot auxiliary is extroverted intuition or exploration, what right. we nicknamed it. So these two functions, cognitive functions that INFP uses, how are they attuned to give us this harmonizing subtype? So the harmonizing subtype is the opposite of the dominant. And so if the dominants, both of those functions have an attunement that is analytic both of these are a holistic preference. And so that they're both open-ended, diffused, taking as much territory as possible, but they don't have that assertive energy. So this is going to be a style of INFP that probably could also benefit from somebody who's really sort of helping support them do day-to-day -day stuff, yeah. <laughs> kind of like the creative. <laughs> um, they're also going to really benefit from uh, people being able to see them for their talents. And so they might benefit from a little bit more of an assertive part of themselves coming up so they can sell themselves yeah. because they usually have a lot to offer. Yeah, so if the dominant INFP would seek positions of leadership to be able to move up the ranks in a way to get something done, to be in leadership, the creative probably needs to seek subsidization like support from somebody or a platform to help support all the stuff that they want to do to be creative yeah the normalizing probably needs to find some entity organization to join like research department or like get a job like almost like go get an actual career at an institution to help support all that 
this harmonizing. Well, I, and and to make sure that they have a, a hobby yes. that feeds their intuition. This harmonizing, I think of like an actor who attaches themselves to a famous director. Like they always, like Quentin Tarantino or uh, what's the guy that, uh, uh, Martin Scorsese, right? Like there's certain actors who have said, that guy, that's my director. Any movie he asks me to be in, I'm going to say yes, no matter what, mm. because I know that he knows his stuff and that movie's going to be successful. So I don't know how to navigate my career, but I'm going to attach myself or focus in on somebody else that has a lot of talent in this. And that's going to help me always have opportunity. Mm -hmm. So the principle here is if you're a harmonizing INFP, maybe think of a principle like that. Maybe there's either a movement or a person or something that you can start to kind of lean in on that helps guide where you're going, gives you that energy and direction because everything being diffused, like you talked about, both your cognitive functions, sometimes you don't know what you want to go toward, or sometimes you don't have the energy kicking up. But if you can attach to other people or other things, I think that could be really helpful for this subtype specifically. Well, and unlike the creative subtype, I don't think this type, subtype ha has as much of a thirst for freedom yeah. in the same way. Yeah. Uh, they're less judgmental as a general rule than any of the other INFPs. In fact, they have a really hard time being judgmental. This is the INFP that doesn't want anybody judging anything ever <laughs> because they're like, it's too complex. You can't understand it. Um, and so if they find themselves in institutions, they usually are fine. Yeah. They're like, okay, like as long as they have a good gig that allows them to do the thing that they're doing well, they're not going to push away from an institution or organization like a creative INFP might. Sure. They, they're less likely to get in a rut, right, um, than the normalizing INFP. Um, so they're kind of in a good position. The, the, the big, of course, the big challenge of being this kind of INFP is that um, uh, there, there is a very difficult time truly communicating what's going on. Even if they have, like all INFPs do, a, a, um, a talent for language, this INFP feels like it's just, it's, uh, it's going to be, uh, they're going to die with all that richness inside of them basically. Yeah. And so that's one of the disadvantages. But again, it's almost always an older INFP that reaches the harmonizing place. All right. So we've covered all four of the INFP subtypes, dominant, creative, normalizing, harmonizing. As you're listening along, are you starting to see which characteristics you identify with? Now you might identify with all of them, first of all, because we have all of these in us, right? right? It's not like you're going to just be this one thing couple key things to mention here. Again, your subtype will influence the career you choose. Your subtype will influence the career you choose. And the career you choose as an INFP will start to influence the subtype you identify with. Mm -hmm. So they both influence each other. So you might have picked, chosen a career you've been doing for the last 20, 30 years. It's going to shape you as a person. It probably has moved you now, it might have been the one you were already wired for originally, but it's probably nurtured you and shaped you into that subtype as an INFP. If you choose a different career and you start to lean into other energies, you can actually change the way you express the nature of your personality. I like to think of it, you're an INFP. That's like the song written on the sheet of music. And then there's four different performances from that song. Like you can perform it with a piano or a guitar or you know, drums or whatever, like you can express it differently. You are an INFP or that's what you identify with. And these are just ways you express and a lot of opportunity for growth is available to you here. Mm. I think we want to make sure that it doesn't feel static. Like, oh, this is, this is, I'm stuck here. I can't get a different career. No, you have a lot of availability and we just want to show how much flexibility in career path you have as a person. Mm. Yeah. So you've been listening along. You haven't had a microphone, but you're the third person in this conversation. And we do want to hear from you. Come over to personalityhacker.com, directly below this episode. Ask a question. I think questions are great because not only we can see your questions, but other people in the community can see your questions and we can get conversations started. So those are fantastic. And the second thing that would be great is to share your story. Stories are compressed experiences. They're a way that we can understand what you've experienced in your life. Maybe you have advice to give. Maybe you have a story that can illustrate moving from one subtype to another or a career path. What has been your career story as an INFP? Are you just starting out? You don't really have a career story. Like I'm getting ready to graduate university and I'm excited and I'm a little nervous. Or maybe you're a little bit further down that road and you've been in the workforce for a little bit and our career path for a little bit. Maybe you've been on this for a while. 
and you're ready to make a transition like many of our clients and students in our personality life path program have talked about. Where are you at in your journey? We'd love to hear from you. So come over, make your voice heard at personalityhacker.com. And if you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. If you leave us a rating and review on iTunes, it helps us out a lot. And I read every one. I really enjoy the reviews. So She really does. I do. She reads every single one. <laughs> every single one. Uh, we're on YouTube now. So you might be watching us as a video podcast. So head over to YouTube um, and put in Personality Hacker. And you will be able to like, subscribe, and hit the bell that lets you know when a new episode is out. We have a book. It's called Personality Hacker. You can get it in all major book retailers. And if you leave us a rating and review on uh Amazon or in Goodreads that also helps us out a lot and we have an absolutely what well, I would call and I'm just going to fluff us up a little bit we have a, pro, a program called the INFP owner's manual that we have poured our heart and soul into really with the intention to make sure that I have, INFP understands their personality type to such a degree that it really actually helps them make good choices in life it just doesn't give information about how you're wired, but it gives information about the phenomena you might be experiencing, some of the loops you might you know, find yourself in when you get gripped uh, by parts of your personality that are maybe a little tyrannical in the moment. It also talks about um, how you get into flow yeah. and how to create that. And it gives you a toolbox of exercises to ensure that this information isn't just interesting. It's actually something powerful in your life. So head over to personalityhacker.com and um, look at our suite of programs and you'll find the INFP owner's manual. And I think that it's, well, I know for a fact that for many people, it's been a game changer. So yeah. I highly recommend heading over there. Yeah, it's really important that we baked into this program principles, not prescriptions, but principles, because we don't, we don't know your exact situation. But we do know if you have INFP preferences, and this applies to all the types we have owner's manuals for, with INFP preferences, we do know how you learn information and make decisions. We do know what kind of struggles INFPs face. We do know what kind of things light them up and get them excited. So we know all the principles, and we lay these out in this program with some exercises. So you can take those principles, almost the ingredient base, and pretty much create the life that you want going forward. So I can't echo enough, Antonio, what you said. If you're an INFP listening, I highly recommend going and getting the INFP owner's manual. I think it's going to, ch it will change your life. We've already seen it change many students and clients' lives so far. It will change your life. Go get it. And uh, we'll see you inside that program because that'd be awesome. All right. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. Thanks for being with us today. We'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker Podcast. Podcast.